Okay, so I've started the recording again. All right, so welcome everybody. I'm going to just do a few housekeeping things before I get started with the slides. Um, I'm going to mute everybody just so we don't have any background noises and stuff um, while I'm talking. And if you have any questions, just a reminder, do put those in the chat. As we're going along, um, we're going to possibly reference other um, website articles and things, and we'll give you links to those as a, as a um, resource that you can look up to those things after. Okay. All right. So everybody should now be muted, except for me. You guys can still hear me, I hope. And let me find the chat here. Sorry, there's multi parts to this thing. Okay, here we go. Oh, that's not the chat. There we go. All right. Okay, complicated because I have two different screens and people are still coming in. So 25 of you. All right, so let's get started with the tips for sharper images. Because this is something that comes up a lot, a lot, a lot um, with my workshops, tours, website, readers, and in the Facebook group, okay? Um, sorry, that's a link I didn't give you, Rob, but if you could provide a link. If um, you're not already a member of our Facebook group, we have over 5,000 people in the group, and it's a great place for sharing your images. So Rob will find that and share that. So what I'm going to share with you in this little presentation is six things that you can do to check your settings and a couple of things to make sure that you have sharper images, okay? Because blurry images is one of the biggest problems that I see a lot of people having, particularly beginners, okay? So wherever you are along your journey of photography, okay, um, blurry images is often a challenge, okay? So the first thing that you want to look at is your focus mode, okay? So what do I mean by focus mode? Okay, so most cameras shoot um, four different options. These are the common ones. So single shot, okay, continuous tracking, auto mode, and manual. So let me explain each of those individually. Okay. The other challenge with a lot of this is that the manufacturers don't have the same names across different brands. So what Canon calls it is one shot, Nikon and Sony call it AFS, Pentax calls it AFS without the dash, and Olympus is SAF. Okay, so in essence, what this mode is, is that it's a single or lock focus. So when you're shooting um, something that is not moving, it's going to lock on the subject and stay there. So when you press your button, it focuses and locks there, okay? <clears throat> you may have your camera set up to use a beep. So when focus lock is attained, you might hear a beep. And if you're looking in your viewfinder, you may see that the square or little point that you're focusing on will flash or change green, okay? So different cameras, again, different things. This option is the best choice when you're shooting non-moving or stationary subjects. Okay, so if you're doing uh, street photography, flowers, uh, still life, architectural, uh, landscape, any of those kinds of things are best for single shot focus mode. Okay. Also best used in conjunction with single shot drive mode and single point focus area. And I'll cover both of those in the next couple of points. Okay, the next option for focus mode is tracking or continuous. Okay, so again, there's different names for this based on different cameras. Okay, so Servo is Canon, AFC, Nikon and Sony, and so on. Okay, so make sure that you know what your camera calls it, what your manufacturer calls it. Okay, now the difference between single focus mode and continuous tracking is that when you press the button down to focus, it does not achieve lock. Okay, so it will continue trying to focus on the subject, whether it's moving or stationary. Okay, so it's going to try and look for something that's moving and follow it. Okay, so the camera will not beep in this mode, so it will not achieve focus lock. So a lot of times I've seen people put this mode on their camera and then say, my camera's not focusing because I'm not hearing the beep. So you won't get a beep because that beep is only for the lock. Okay. So when you want to use this mode is when you have a moving subject, particularly one that is coming closer to and further away from the camera. So the distance to the camera is changing with the subject. So that could be sports, uh, pets, toddlers, uh, panning, if you're shooting like cars, or something like that, bicycles, anything that is moving, okay? 
this mode is best used in conjunction with high speed burst mode. Again, I'll cover this in a moment and multiple point or zone focus, okay? So just to reiterate and, and review, tracking focus, as long as you have your finger sort of halfway down on the button, it's going to continue to focus, okay? As the subject moves. And some cameras are better at this than others, okay? So if you have um, a point and shoot or if you have a bridge camera, which is sort of like halfway between an SLR or a bigger camera, bigger mirrorless and a point and shoot, like it's got a big zoom and it's got a few other features, right? Some of those cameras may not be as, as good at this mode as like a full mirrorless or SLR camera. Okay, the next one is auto autofocus mode. Okay, so it's a little bit confusing. So what this one is doing, again, it has different names between the different cameras. Canon calls it AI or artificial intelligence. So that kind of gives you a hint at what is happening under the hood, okay? So when we look at what this mode is doing is the camera is then deciding between the other two modes for you. So it's going to try and determine whether the subject is moving or not moving and use the correct mode um, based on what it assesses it to be, okay? But the biggest problem with this mode is that the camera often chooses incorrectly, okay? Anytime you can have auto modes for your camera, it's taking away some of that control that you have. So it's simplifying it, but in this essence, um, this one is good in theory because it sounds like it's great, right? Then you just set it on this and forget it. Don't, don't worry about it, okay? But in, in reality, this is, this is not the best choice, right? I do not know any professionals that use this shooting mode, okay? So that should tell you something. And I highly recommend just not using it, okay? Pick either single if you have a stationary, non-moving subject, or continuous if you have a moving subject, okay? My camera generally lives on single because I'm not shooting moving subjects as much, like I'm usually doing street photography or, um, Travel, not so much right now, right? But usually I am just choosing my focus because my subject is not moving, right? And then our last one is, of course, manual focus, okay? So there's a couple of things here to be aware of, okay? First of all, how do you turn manual focus on or in essence, turning autofocus off? So you may have a switch on your lens, okay? That's common with Canon and Nikon. You may have a switch on the lens, <clears throat> excuse me, you may have a switch on the lens and on the body. Again, common for some Nikons. Okay, so some Nikons have just the lens, some have both. So you have to do two switches. Some have a ring on the lens that you sort of click. So you push it forward or pull it back to lock or unlock the manual focus or autofocus. And some of them, like Olympus, you have to actually go into your menu settings to change it to manual focus. Okay. <clears throat> Whoops, my heading is wrong on that one. <laughs> that should say manual focused, pardon me. Okay, so the how you set it up and how you do it is there's usually a, act, an actual ring on your lens that you will then turn to focus, okay? If you're using manual focus, um, you can use live view on the back of your camera. So assuming that we're all using digital cameras, not film cameras, you can use live view to assist you. So what that means is you've got the image pr previewing or sort of playing. If you're using a mirrorless camera, it's always the case, right? It's always on your screen. There's usually a magnify button. It looks like a little magnifying glass or a plus sign. If you press that, what happens is it zooms in on the screen without zooming the lens, and then you can rotate the dial to focus and see better at sort of a 10 times zoom, okay? Another option if you have a mirrorless camera is called focus peaking. So that's something that you would activate in your menu so that what you see on your screen is anything that's in focus is highlighted with a color, okay? I have mine set to red, so if I'm using manual focus, anything that's in focus sort of is outlined in this red um, focus peaking, so you see what's in focus. 
This one is often um, used for macro photography, astrophotography, or anytime you want critical, critical focus. Okay, so I'm going to add one extra thing here, which I didn't put in the notes, and that is manual focus is not the same as manual shooting mode. Okay, this is something that people confuse a lot, that if they are shooting in manual mode, as in the dial on the top of your camera, the M, that you, ought to you also have to use manual focus. That is not the case. Okay, so they are not um, joined at the hip. They do not have to go together. So you can use manual shooting mode and autofocus, or you can use one of the auto shooting modes and manual focus. Okay, so they are not tied together. Okay, uh, thing number two that you can do to get sharper images is setting your focus area. Okay, so what I mean by focus area, okay, when you look through your camera and you see in the viewfinder, depending on your camera, you might see nine or 30 or even 90 or some cameras even have hundreds of different focus points. Okay, so when you press the button halfway down, that's the little light that lights up that shows you where it's focusing, okay? So you have a choice of how to, to configure that. Okay? And this is called focus area or focus point. Okay, so you can use single point, larger or expanded, multiple or zone, or all of them. Okay, so let's take a look at each and when to use them. Okay, so single point, this should be pretty obvious, is that when you choose one. So one of those, however many dots or points your camera has to focus, you choose one and then you're able to move it around within the square of your frame to the subject. <clears throat> this is the most precise and most accurate method to focus. And this is how I have my camera set up probably 95% of the time. I'm picking the dot, I'm choosing where to focus exactly, okay? Again, best for stationary or non-moving subjects, okay? Because if you're trying to do a single point on a bird that's flying across the sky or a toddler that's running across the, the field of view, you're gonna have a really hard time getting that point on this moving target. <clears throat> okay, now I want to talk a little bit about cross point sensors. Okay, tell me in the chat, does anybody know what a cross type sensor is or a cross point type sensor is? And this has to do with how your camera actually physically does the focusing. Does anybody know what that is? Um, bonus points if you know how many your camera has. Okay. I'm just waiting for you guys to type. I don't see any typing. Any answers? Boris, come on, you must know this, Boris. Boris is like my star portrait pupil. <laughs> That's why we're here, Anne says. <laughs> okay, all right, well, I won't keep you in suspense then. Okay, so they are special, okay? So the center point, depend, regardless of how many of these points you have, the center one is always what's called a cross type sensor. Okay, so what this means is that usually when you are focusing, your camera only sees contrast horizontally, okay? In a center or in a cross type sensor, it sees contrast both directions. Okay, now this also has to do with the type of camera and the type of sensor that you have in your, in your camera. But the simplest version is if you always use the center point, it's going to be quicker to focus because it sees contrast both directions, okay? So it can see and focus better and quicker. So in low light, it's more accurate and it will definitely focus faster as well, okay? So if you find that your camera is struggling to focus, especially in a dark um, scenario, a dark room, put it on that center point and try that because it's going to be it's going to give you a little boost it's going to help your camera be able to do that okay also going back to the manual focus thing if your camera is struggling to focus in the dark how are you going to be able to do that in manual focus um, another sort of misnomer oh let me let a couple people into the room here another couple of misnomer of things that i've heard on um, misinformation people trying to use manual focus when their camera can't focus because the, the room is too dark right but if it's too dark for your camera to focus i don't know about you but i can't see either i don't see well in the dark right so use those other tools that i talked about in terms of the center point focus and we'll talk a little bit more about how to improve focus in the dark coming up as well. 
Okay, so the next one outside of single point is zone or multiple point focus. Okay, so there's one that's in between, which I mentioned on the first slide, which is expanded point. So you can have a single point, and depending on your camera, I know with my Fuji, I can make it really small or I can just make it a little bigger. So it kind of encompasses a larger area. Okay, so that's what expanded point means. So most of the time I have it set smaller. Okay, so you can expand one single point or you can go to what's called zone or multiple point. So this becomes when several of the points that your camera uses to focus are then active, okay? It's more flexible, so going back to our birds flying through the scene scenario, okay? You get to control which area. So for example, you might set it to the middle third of your image, okay? And then you just have to try and keep the subject in the middle third of the frame. Obviously, again, this is the choice for moving objects, okay? So you don't use multiple point for stationary objects. The reason being is that your camera is going to it, try and to interpret the subject, but let's say uh, you're shooting through a fence or somebody puts their hand up, I don't know if you can see my hand, um, somebody puts their hand up like this in front of the screen, it's going to focus on whatever is closest to the camera, right? Some of the newer cameras, especially Sony's, are really good at face detection and eye point detection, right? But again, they still can get it wrong. Okay, so if you're shooting a non-moving subject, go back to the single point, place it precisely, okay? If you're using the moving subjects, go to zone or multi, okay? And this is something that can get really, really complicated depending on the camera. I know when I bought my 5D Mark III years ago, I actually had to go watch a YouTube video on the focus modes because there was like an entire menu with six pages inside the camera of different focus modes. So if you're not clear on what your options are, go to YouTube, search for your camera model, and focus or focus tutorials and then find a good video that will walk you through how all of those settings work with your camera. Okay, the last one is all focus points. Okay, so this one means that all the points that your camera has are active. Okay, so we're giving up more control, or giving more control to the camera. Okay, so now the camera is choosing where to focus over the entire scene. So not just a zone or a section of the image, but the entire scene. Okay, so this one is best if you have rapidly moving, randomly changing direction subjects, okay? This is also the mode, funny enough, that I usually put my camera in if I'm handing it to somebody else to take my picture, okay? Because I can't tell you how many out of focus pictures of myself I have when I'm traveling because I hand the camera to somebody, I got a single point and they focus on the background, right? So this is the one that I trained it to when somebody is taking my picture because I just want it to be foolproof. <laughs> Rob said, wants to make the point that he gets the shot when he's doing it though. He knows how to focus. Yes, he does. Okay, number three is your drive mode. Okay, so most cameras have several options in terms of setting your drive mode. So this is how the camera actually fires and takes the picture. So you have single frame, continuous low or high, self timer, and then some cameras have some others such as silent, especially if you're using a mirrorless camera, silent mode is great for stealth shooting. Okay? It might even have a remote mode if you have a, a wireless remote, like I know Canons have that mode, or it might even have an intervalometer, which allows you to do things like time lapse and star trails. Okay? So for the purpose of, of this um, exercise or tutorial, we're gonna talk about the first three only. Okay, so single drive mode, again, should sound pretty straightforward. This is when you press the button, all the way down, so this is the shutter button, you press it all the way down, the camera only takes one picture. So no matter how long you hold the button in or how hard you press it, you only get one picture at a time, okay? Best choice for stationary objects, okay? So remember I mentioned that earlier, there's a set of settings that go together for stationary objects and a set that go together for moving objects. Okay, high speed burst mode is on the other end of the spectrum, okay? This is now when you press the shutter button down, it takes a series of images. So you might hear that, you know, click, 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 okay? 
depending on whether you have high speed or low burst mode set and the frame rate that your camera takes. Okay? So that's usually somewhere between three frames per second and some of the really high end cameras will do 10 or more. Okay? And if you're using a mirrorless camera, you can actually shoot really fast because the, the drawback of a DSLR in this regard is that the uh, mirror keeps going down every time, right? So when you're shooting multiple images with a mirrorless camera, there is no mirror. You can take a whole bunch at a time, okay? This is best for moving objects, right? So single for, for stationary, high, high speed burst for moving, right? This is where you're gonna take, say, five or six images of a moving target, and hopefully you'll capture the peak of action in one of those, okay? Because they're gonna only be slightly different, but the differences from you know a half a second to the next half a second might make the difference between a good shot and a great shot. Okay. Sorry, letting somebody into the room again. Okay, so self-timer mode is the next one. So this is where your camera, once you press the shutter button, has a delay of two to 10 seconds. Okay, so this is a great one to use if you don't have a shutter release, right? And when you would wanna use this mode is if you're doing self-portraits, for example, and you wanna go get in the shot, uh, which I did recently. Uh, we had a barbecue and for my family, we hadn't been together for a couple of months because of all the um, COVID stuff. So we wanted to do a group photo. So I set up the camera, 10 second timer, went and got in the picture myself, right? The other reason you wanna use that is if you're doing any kind of long exposure, you don't want to be touching the camera when the exposure happens. So set it to two second timer, press the button and then take your hands away, right? I've seen many times as well in my workshops and tours where this person will press the button, have the timer on and still keep their finger on the button. So remember, take your finger off the button, hands up, right? After you press it. Number four is aperture, okay? All right, I want to do a little questionnaire for you guys now. What is the most common cause of blurry pictures? I wanna see your guesses, okay? Now it may not be what you think. We're in the aperture point here in the aperture category, but you tell me, what is the reason, <laughs> Valerie says rotten photographer. Uh, yes, that's certainly one, okay? Rob says camera shake. Okay, anybody Subject else? Movement. Subject movement. Subject movement, yes. Anybody else? Okay, too slow shutter speed, focusing on the wrong point. Okay, all right, hands not steady. Yes, all of those are great things, okay. Um, Joanne says she entered late. Uh, not to worry, Joanne, at the beginning I indicated that we are going to record this. So if you don't want to be on camera later, uh, right now it's just me on camera with a slide, so you don't have to worry about it. But once we get to the Q&A part, if you don't want to be recorded, just stay off camera. But yes, we are recording it. Okay, so the biggest reason is shutter speed too slow. So that goes to camera shake and also to slow shutter speed, right? Um, now, I'm not sure uh, what A to Z said, uh, low F boho background. Oh, so I think what they mean is if you have like a big aperture and the background is really out of focus. Um, actually, I'm going to say the opposite. Okay, so what happens is that apparently I'm missing my title. <laughs> Let's try that, <laughs> okay? So how does that relate to aperture since this is the aperture point? Well, they work together, okay? So I like to think of it as a teeter-totter for those of us that grew up with playgrounds that had teeter-totters still. I'm sure they're too dangerous now, right? So they, when one goes up, the other has to go down, okay? So they have to stay in balance because your camera is always trying to find zero or medium gray. So it's always trying to expose for medium gray. So if you close the aperture down, the shutter speed consequently then is going to be slow, okay? So let's have a look at how that works, okay? When you have an aperture like the one on the right, okay? So if you're not clear on which is the big aperture and which is the small aperture, okay? I have a little trick for you. Okay, so if you look at the aperture and the way they're written right below that image, so it's, for example, okay, on the right, F slash 22. On the left, F slash 1.8.
so what other things do you see written like that, right, in math, okay? It's a fraction. So it's a relative comparison because the ratio is, is actually, um, sorry, I used the ratio. Your aperture is a ratio of the focal length of the lens divided by the actual width of the opening, which ends up with this fraction, okay? So if you think of it as a fraction, which is bigger, 1 22nd, or let's use two, okay, or one half, okay? If you want a, a piece of pie, do you want a 20th of a piece of pie, 20th of the pie, or do you want half of the pie, okay? If you really like pie, okay, you want half, okay? So half is the bigger one, that's the bigger opening, okay? Now, why do you want to get a nice f1.8 lens is because it has that big opening. So the opening you see on the left is what you would find in like a 35 mil, uh, prime lens, okay, so prime is one that does not zoom, or a 50 mil prime lens. If you have, for example, a kit lens that goes from 18 to 55 or even higher, 18 to 135, they have what's called a variable aperture range. So when you are zoomed out to the widest point, which is 18 millimeters, you get to have usually an aperture of about 3.5. But when you zoom in to the longest part of the lens, okay, now you only have 5.6 as your, as your biggest aperture. It doesn't go any bigger than that, okay? So you can see how that comes into play, okay? So what is the slowest shutter speed that you can handhold? Okay, now those of you that have done any workshops with me in the past or doing any of my courses should know this answer, okay? So what is the slowest shutter speed that you can use your camera without a tripod and worry about getting camera shake. Okay, so Valerie says one over, close, one over the focal length, Valerie, focal length. Yes, so one over the focal length. So for example, okay, if you are using a 200 millimeter lens, you need to be shooting at at least one over 200 or faster. Okay, now if you have image stabilization, which might be called IS or VR um, or something else, depending on your camera, you can kind of get away with a little bit more, but also know if your hands are shaky that you need to go a little bit faster if you know that that's a challenge for you, right? Or you drank too much coffee this morning, okay? So always make sure that you're sort of that one over your focal length. So if you're using, going back to our example of 18 to 135 mil lens, okay? At the 18 end, you can get away with say one over 20. But when you're zoomed into one over, when you're zoomed into 135, now you need to have like one over 150. Okay, so you see what happens is that your shutter speed needs to be faster. But when you're zoomed in on that lens, your aperture is smaller, so they're kind of you're you're kind of shooting yourself in the foot, right? It becomes a challenge, and that's why a lot of people struggle with shooting in low light. So I highly, highly recommend getting a 35 mil 1.8 or a 50 mil 1.8 prime lens, okay? Okay, so now your tips for aperture. So how do you make this work to get sharper images? So the first is use the most appropriate aperture. What that means is make sure you have enough depth of field. Okay, so make sure that you're shooting your subject and part of them is in focus. Like if you're doing um, a photo of a group of people, if you're shooting at f1.8, which is very narrow depth of field. So depth of field is the amount of, of how do I explain it? The depth of field is the amount of your picture or how deep the focus goes into your picture. So if I focus at four feet, do I have six inches of depth of field or do I have two feet, okay? So make sure that you have enough for a group that you can cover everybody because the people in the back row, they want to be in focus too, right? But at the same time, you also need to make sure that you have enough shutter speed to compensate for what we just talked about with the camera shake, okay? So if you're shooting in low light, okay, don't be shooting at F11 because what happens when you go to F11, right? You're going to end up with a slow shutter speed. Right. So that's why at, at night when you're doing anything like night photography, blue hour, that type of thing, waterfalls, right, anything where you're going to be shooting with a smaller aperture or a longer exposure, you need to use a tripod. Right? Now this is something that I didn't even put into the slides, but you definitely add it as a bonus tip of using a tripod will definitely help you get sharper images as well. I find that people are afraid of tripods. <laughs> tell me, tell me in the chat if you have a tripod and you never use it. I'd love to know 
how many people have a tripod and are either afraid to use it or find it too annoying or a pain in the butt and they never take it with them. So please admit it, put your hand up or put your, put your message in the chat who has a tripod and doesn't use it. Okay, so number five is where you focus in your picture, okay? Where you focus does matter, okay? So I see a couple of people. Denise says, tripod's painful. Valerie leaves it at home. Nina has a tripod, hasn't used it yet. Right, take it with you, don't bring it out. <laughs> Did you haul it all the way to Italy, Lorraine, and not use it? Because I used mine actually quite a bit when I was there, okay? So getting back to my slides, where you focus matters, okay? So what you wanna do is you need to focus on an area of contrast. So I mentioned earlier with the, the cross type um, focus point and the center focus point is that the camera looks for contrast. So if you point your camera at a blank wall, like I'm looking at a plain wall in my office right in front of me, if you point your camera at a blank wall, it cannot focus, okay? If you've ever had that experience where you're trying to focus on something, or even if you're shooting an extremely soft light with a low contrast ratio, right, you may have a hard time focusing. If you add to that that it's dark, okay, so now everything is sort of medium gray to black, your camera's gonna struggle even more, okay? So pick an area in the scene that has the most contrast and focus there, right? So at night, I generally focus on a light source or something that I shine the flashlight on to focus. If you're photographing a person or anything that has eyes, okay, so at pets, right, animals, make sure that you focus on the eyes, right? If they are turned slightly sideways or profile or partial profile, make sure that you focus on the eye, I don't know if you can see me, that's closest to the camera. Because if you focus on the eye that is away from the camera, um, it kind of looks weird. Try it both ways, but Generally, most pros will agree that the eye closest to the camera is the one that you want sharp, right? Especially if you have a really narrow depth of field and the rest of their face and their ears start to fall out of focus, that one eye being sharp will, will give the impression that your, your image is sharp, right? If, if their eyes are not sharp, but their ears are in focus, it's out of focus, right? Next, where to focus, okay? And I know that there was a question about this in terms of how far into your scene. For example, if you want to get maximum amount of focus, okay, your focus is, what happens is where you focus, I mentioned four feet. So if I focus four feet from me and my focus is, um, depth of field is three feet, one third of that is towards the camera and two thirds of that is on the other side of the subject. Okay, so if you focus in front of the subject, okay, you're actually losing some focus in front of them that you don't need, some depth of field. Okay, so focus sort of one third in, and this comes into play like if you're doing a group photo or something like that. If you have like three rows of people, usually what I do is I focus sort of on the first row's shoulder or slightly behind the first row. Okay, if you're doing macro photography and you're in really super close, right, now you wanna focus about halfway in because the depth of field shifts, so it's half in front and half behind your subject, okay? An advanced thing of where to focus is if you're doing landscape photography, and I think there was a question from Anne on this one about finding the hyperfocal distance, right? So the hyperfocal distance, the short answer to that is the place that you can focus in your scene that will give you sort of the maximum latitude or the maximum amount of, of focus within your scene, right? There are actually apps that will help you calculate that. And number six, back button focus. So this is a bit of an advanced um, option and I'm actually gonna be doing a, a video or an article on this soon on the website. Okay, so for those of you that haven't already visited our website, uh, it's Digital Photo Mentor, like my sign up here behind me in the desert. Okay, so do make sure if you haven't visited the website, we've got lots of things there for you. And uh, we actually have this entire thing as, as an article with a free cheat sheet for you. And we'll give you that link at the end. Okay, so back button focus is a little more advanced. It takes a little bit of time to set up, right? What is it? So back button focus, what it is is normally I mentioned you and you press the shutter button, that's when you focus and then you press it all the way down, it takes the picture, okay? Back button focus means that you're separating the focus function 
and the taking of the picture function to two different buttons. Okay, so what you want to do is customize your camera so that it's using a button on the back of the camera. Uh, I don't know if you can see me or not. If I'm small on your screen, okay. But on the back of my camera, I usually use this button right here. Okay, so I'm focusing with this button and taking the picture with the shutter button. Okay. So that's what it is. Okay, so why would you want to do this? So earlier we talked about the continuous tracking focus where you're shooting moving subjects, okay? So when the subject is moving back and forth away from you, if you're using the tracking focus and you you're, have all the functions set to your shutter button, when you press it halfway down, it's gonna track the subject, okay? But the second that you push it all the way down, your camera shifts from focusing to shooting, okay? Because you can't do two things with one button at the same time. So when you change it up and change the focus to a different button, now I'm using my thumb on the back of the camera to focus and my index finger to press the shutter button so you can actually do both at the same time. Okay, so it's a little bit tricky and it takes a little bit of getting used to because when you press the shutter button, the camera does not focus anymore. Okay, so I know we talked about this in, our, in my portrait um, fundamentals students class a week ago, and one guy said that he forgets all the time. So now he's, he's written himself a note with tape on his camera to remind himself back button focus. But it's one of those things where if you struggle with it and push through that initial sort of frustration, you will never go back, okay? And I actually learned how to do this from a friend of mine who used to be a sports photographer for the, uh, for the Edmonton Sun, okay? So this is how sports photographers do it, okay? How you set it up, again, this is gonna vary from camera to camera. Um, on the Fuji, it's super simple. I literally just switch my, my camera dial on the front to manual, and that back button becomes my focus button automatically, okay? If I want to use the back button in continuous mode, then I have some menu stuff to do. But for most cameras, there's going to be an option for customizing your buttons or for customizing um, how your camera shoots. So go through your camera manual, and if you can't find it, it may not be called back button focus, it may be called button customization or something like that. Okay, go through your camera manual. If you can't find it, go back to YouTube, search for your camera model and back button focus or how to set it up. Um, I'm sure there's probably a video there to walk you through that process. Okay, so when to use it. Okay, so back to the uh, moving subjects. But I, I set my camera to that most of the time. So even if I am using a, photographing a stationary subject, for example, a portrait or um, architecture, okay, let's say I want to do various different compositions. Okay, so if I have it's set to the main shutter button and you wanna do different composition, you have to focus on the eyes, so you gotta hold it halfway down, keep your button held down, keep your finger on the button, recompose and take your shot, okay? If you're using back button focus, you just press the button and let go, you're on single, okay? So it's gonna lock on the subject and as long as they are not moving and you are not moving, you can recompose and angle your camera however you want as long as the distance doesn't change and all your shots will be the same. Okay, um, and I think this is a question that came up um, in one of the pre-submitted questions is what to shoot at night or when it's dark. This is the mode that I use at night as well. Okay, so I use the back button to focus and lock on my subject. I light the subject up at the same time with a flashlight or I have an assistant so that I'm able to focus and then um, leave it, don't touch it. Okay, so if I move the tripod again, then I have to focus, okay? So Heather wants to know, so you don't have to hold down the back button. Not if I'm using the single focus, okay? So if I'm using single, I press it, I get the lock, and then I let go, like at night. If I'm shooting moving subjects, maybe a dancer or a pet or something that's moving, then I'm gonna be in continuous, focusing, continuous tracking or focus mode. I'm gonna be on high speed drive, okay? And I'm gonna hold the button down on the back, okay? And then when I go to shoot, I'm gonna hold the shutter button down as well. So I'm actually holding two. So how you hold your camera makes a big difference as well. Because keeping in mind that your right hand, okay, I wanna come off of my slides here so you can see me better, because I think that's my last slide, okay. Can you guys see me better now? 
Okay, so when you are holding your camera, okay, I see a lot of people hold their camera this way, okay? This doesn't actually support your camera very well, like your thumb under the lens. You always want to put palm up, okay? So think about asking for money, okay? Put your palm up, camera sits on your palm, and then this hand, the right hand, is the button pusher, okay? Button pusher only. Okay, so I've come to the end of the slides. I'm going to let you guys unmute now. I've got a bunch of questions that are pre-submitted, so let me call those up. Um, Rob, can you share the link to the article for them? So the article I mentioned covers all of these things that I just talked about, all the different modes, and we've actually created a cheat sheet for you, which you can download from the article. So if you go to the article, which Rob has just put in the chat, you can download the cheat sheet, which will give you a way to um, print it out and take it with you. Okay, so you can check all of these things uh, when you're actually in the field. Okay, so I've got everybody's questions here. We had about 19 questions submitted. And if there's any others as they come up or anything that came up, any questions before I start with those about anything that I covered in these notes here? Tell me, tell me in the chat, or you guys can unmute now if you want. Um, did you pick up something from that? I see some nodding. <laughs> okay. Awesome. I'm just gonna wait for that. Anybody wanna say anything? You guys are all shy. Okay, so I'm gonna start with the questions, and these are in no particular order, just where I pulled from the meetup group, okay? So Kimberly asked, how do I get the exposure right? Should I under or over expose? Um, Rob, if you could please share a link for the one about what happens if your snow is gray. Okay, so the way that your camera measures light is I mentioned that it is reading the light coming from your subject back into the camera. Um, okay, who is talking? Somebody's volume I'm hearing. Yeah, if you're not asking a question, if you could just mute yourself because we get a lot of sort of background noise. And then if you have a question, just unmute yourself. Perfect, thanks guys. <clears throat> okay, so your camera tries to make medium gray, which ironically, I'm wearing a gray shirt, okay? So your camera tries to make everything this tone or, or so, so about, okay? But if your subject is, is darker than medium gray, it's going to overexpose it or make it too bright. If your subject is like lighter or white, it's going to underexpose it to make it gray. Because you have to understand how your camera meter works. So if I'm understanding your question correctly, Kimberly, are you here in the meeting? Yes. Kimberly, do you want to unmute yourself? I'm going to unmute you. Okay, so what did you mean by that question? Like, do you mean exposure compensation or something else? Um, no, like most people, like some of the photographers I know always say to expose to the right, like to overexpose. Ah, so you okay. make sure that you're, that you have everything correct, I guess, in camera. So what is your, what is your thought on that? Okay, so I understand the theory of exposed to the right. So for those yeah. of you that don't know what that means, it means that your histogram going to the right is, is white, going to the left is black. So more information is stored on the, the right side of the histogram than the left. So what they're suggesting is by overexposing and pushing everything to the right, you'll have more information. Okay, my challenge is I tend to not do that myself. I tend to use the correct exposure because what happens if you're photographing a black cat on a black background? right? You're mm. going to expose it and make the cat gray. And then later you have to edit it and make it all darker. Okay. So either way, you're causing yourself a bit more work. You might have more information, but it's not necessarily the correct exposure. Okay. Okay. Um, I come from the film world. So back in the day, I used to shoot slide film. So slide film is not forgiving, right? Negatives were. Um, but if you shot a slide that was overexposed, it's like white. If you shot a slide that was too dark, it was just no detail, right? So I kind of think of digital as, as the same as slides, and I tend to want to get the correct exposure. But okay. if you read the article that Rob just linked to in the, in the chat about, it will tell you how to use the histogram and interpret it so that you get the most appropriate exposure. Does that make sense? Okay. Yeah. Thanks. So not the correct exposure, but the appropriate one, okay? Okay. 
Okay, Jade wants to know, images that look good on the camera, but on the computer, they're dark and washed out. How can I fix that? Okay, so that is a bit of a trickier question because then we're talking about, um, and she's not in the meetup. Okay, so I'm gonna try and interpret her question. So generally the, the challenge when your images don't look the same on your phone or if you share them to Facebook or something later, it's either one of two things. Either you've saved them in the wrong, what's called color space, or your monitor that you've used to edit the pictures is not properly calibrated. Okay, so to calibrate your monitor, you need to have a device, which I happen to have here. So it's, you need to have a little device like this. Um, maybe Rob, if you wanna share my Amazon list on computer bits, it's in there. So this is called an i1 by x -Right. Um, spider makes some color monkey it's also made by spider so what that does is it hangs in front of your camera you run a little program and it flashes a series of, of tones and colors that this device reads and then sets your your monitor to neutral brightness and neutral color so that for example if your monitor is set too warm so everything is really yellow on your screen because you like warm things if you go to try and print that it's going to come out opposite or blue if your monitor is set to um, if your monitor is set too bright, all your prints are going to be too dark. Okay, so it's always opposite. So if things are coming out too dark on different devices, it's chances are that your monitor brightness is probably too high. Okay. Okay, Jen wants to know, can you give me the best tip for posing people in the most flattering way? Um, that's a tricky question to answer as well. Posing people is rather difficult. Um, I recommend posing people in a, in a way that looks natural to them, but sometimes they're not gonna feel comfortable, okay? So you wanna make sure things, here's some kind of quick tips. Um, make sure that if you're photographing ladies that you don't have like a hand that looks like a fist like this, cause this is not very mass, very feminine. Use the side of the hand, so you want to have the pinky. So if I'm doing this, not this, okay? So side of hand. Okay, and then the opposite is true for men. You want to have more of the fist, not this. Because guys, you know, doing this is very feminine, okay? Which for some men might be appropriate. So it's more, I guess, rather men and female, we have to be conscious of, of that now, is that masculine versus feminine, okay? So if you have a feminine person, feminine hand pose, masculine hand pose. Um, if you're doing a standing pose, um, if it bends, bend it is sort of the general rule of thumb, which means don't stand or don't have them standing perfectly like a board, like straight, right? So bend their elbows so that it causes um, diagonal lines and separations between the arms and the body. Um, put the weight on one hip away from the camera, right? Never stick your butt towards the camera. Um, turn your body slightly as well. So for example, here, let me just lower my camera a little bit here so when the body is straight to the camera like square on okay this is your widest okay so turning the body slightly notice that slams okay now i'm also my light is here so i'm facing my light turning the body away from the light now my body is in shadow okay so also slimming okay leaning towards the camera so the head becomes larger than the body if you're concerned about body and another pose that works really well for somebody who's body conscious is to, uh, this works great with couples or families with small children, is to get them to lie down on the grass on their elbows like this, right? And you can have them lean or what have you. And if there's any small kids, get them to pile on top. And the man and the, and the woman can, or the couple can link their arms together and make a really nice pose. So your camera angle would be slightly higher than eye level so they, they're going to look up. Okay, because the other thing is when you're looking up, right, your chin is going to, you're going to stretch out. Okay, so leaning forward stretches out the neck, right, versus doing this. <laughs> okay, so not so flattering. Flattering. Okay, so just having them lean slightly forward from the waist automatically will stretch this out. But you don't want them doing this because now you're just looking up their nose. Okay, so don't look up the nostrils. And be conscious of um, guys with, with receding hairlines or big foreheads, people with big foreheads. If your camera's too high, then their forehead's gonna look bigger, okay? So camera angle as well, see? So I hope that's kind of some quick tips for posing. <laughs> All right, Felicia has a question about quality and she's not here. Um, settings for quality images. So I'm not really sure. Again, I'm trying to interpret what she means. 
Um, you always want to make sure that you're shooting the largest size. Rob, there's an article on quality of images. If you could find that one for me and pop that in the chat, right? So there, make sure you're shooting the largest size and that's in terms of pixels, okay? So if your camera offers small, medium, large or fine, fine, normal and, and low resolution, always go for the biggest, okay? If you are shooting raw, even better, okay? Um, if, if you're not shooting raw yet, make sure you're shooting the largest quality JPEG that you can get. Always start with the biggest everything in camera. You can always downsize later. You can't go the other way around. Okay, so for example, if you shoot an image with your phone that you want to make a wall hanging of, it's not going to come out very good. Okay. Any other questions while I'm going along here? Rob's finding things. Yes, the monitor calibrator is X1 I1 Display Pro. That's the one. Um, quality of images post. There's literally, I'm going to find it while we're searching here. I think it's just called best quality images or best, yeah, something like that. Okay, and then there was another question. So I'm trying to stay on top of all of your guys' questions here. And Ron says, yes, hangs in front of your monitor. So you plug it into USB and then this part reads the, this, this part here reads the colors, so it literally touches your screen, right? Joanne says, as ridiculous as it sounds, I wonder which eye to use on the viewfinder. I wear glasses and a slightly larger nose. Hey, me too. <laughs> um, I'm right-handed and left eye dominant. My camera always feels clumsy to my face. So I'm left-handed, but I still use my left eye. I always focus with my left eye and I use my glasses. Um, partly because if I take my glasses off, I can set the diopter, which is that little dial right next to your viewfinder usually, but then I can't read the menus on my camera, so I have to put my glasses back on. So I shoot with my glasses, and that's just how I've always gotten used to doing it. Um, you have to use whichever one feels comfortable. If you can do it with your right eye, you know, go for it. There is no right or wrong. It's whatever feels comfortable. Okay. I'm still looking for the quality of images one. I'm not finding it. Okay. Um, Anne wants to know, how does one set exposure for portrait that has lots of shadows, um, such as in the miracle field? You want to generally set your metering mode to average or matrix to take into account the entire scene. So if there's lots of highlights and shadows, like my picture behind, okay, it's not going to measure either the dark or the light air. It's going to measure both and do an average. Uh, I found the best quality images article, so I'm going to put that into the chat here. There we go. Okay, so next question. Okay, Arinda. Is Arinda here? No. Okay, so let's just try and answer her questions. She wants to know, what are the techniques to make photos better? So that's kind of a long, vague question, and I'm not really sure what she means. Um, she could mean editing. So I'm gonna pop, have Rob, can you pop the link in for the seven day challenge? So I did a couple of meetups um, a while back before all this um, COVID started, actually when it just had started back in March, April, and we ran a seven day photo editing challenge. And I know that some of you have gone through that already, but basically it just walks you through a video each day with some tips on how to get better at processing your images. So for me, there's kind of two schools of thought on whether or not to process images. There's the purists that say it needs to be perfect in camera. And then there's, there's the extreme other end, which is people that are doing like digital art and serious things, compositing multiple images together, stuff like that. I fall somewhere in the middle. I do process all my images. So I do believe that even back in the film days, images were processed to a certain degree. Um, there was darkroom work done to enhance darging and burning. I did retouching to do tone control. So enhancing your images digitally is no different than doing so in the darkroom, right? So if you want to check out that, you can sign up for the seven day challenge and actually you get a copy of my raw files to work with for each lesson so you can follow along with the same image. 
Okay, Lorraine, your question. So if you want to unmute, you can. So she says, I always struggle with sharpness in low light situation where tripods are not possible. Is higher ISO better than lower shutter speed? Okay, so do you want to come on camera, Lorraine? Are you yeah. ready? <laughs> okay, so yes. I'm gonna ask you, after we just did this little webinar info, what do you think is the correct answer? Well, I'm definitely gonna have to look more at my shutter speeds because that, that's probably what I'm not paying attention to. I use the zebra, um, the, the color lines, so that if it'll say something is underexposed and then I just do like a minus one or a minus two, but I'm probably not paying enough attention. Okay, go back to that. What do you mean the zebra? I'm, you lost me at the zebra. <laughs> oh, um, I think that's what it's called. It's a pattern so that when you, you shoot, it, it highlights the, the over bright area. And oh, clipping. It's, it's called clipping. Clipping. Okay. I use that. And then if I, if I do a negative one or a negative two, then they disappear. And that means it's a correct exposure, but I'm not paying attention to what the numbers mean. Right. Okay. So there's two things about that. So clipping means that it's going off the chart generally on the area of overexposure. And what clipping means is that it's flashing on your screen or, or it's right. called the blink, mm -hmm. blinkies or the zebra or whatever you call mm -hmm. it. Um, and that means no detail in that area, okay? So right. the answer to your question is, it's going to depend on the exposure. So for example, if there's a window behind me and it's bright, okay, do you need detail in the window behind me or do you need detail in me? Right, okay. Right, so you have to decide what the subject is and if the area that's blinking or exposed is important to have detail or not, okay? So that's the first part. The second part is goes back to what I talked about the appropriate exposure, not you know the correct exposure. So the appropriate exposure might mean blowing out the background, okay? Um, the second thing is you asked about higher ISO. So yes, I would I prefer to raise my ISO quite high. So Rob, if you want to uh, give that one on the fear of high ISO, okay? So I find that a lot of people hear you know, they say, right, they say a lot of things. <laughs> they say to keep your ISO as low as possible for the best quality images. However, going back to what we talked about in the slides earlier, if your shutter speed is a 30th of a second and you're shooting with a 200 mil lens, you're not gonna get sharp images, okay? So your ISO might be low, but you're either gonna have an underexposed image or a blurry one because of the shutter speed. So I would rather have an image that has a bit of noise because of ISO than a blurry one because of the shutter speed. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Um, Ron is asking me a question about the Amazon.com link goes for good for non-Canadians. It should take you to a Canadian, uh, the Canadian, if you're going to that from the, from the website, Ron, it should take you to the to .ca. Um, if it's not, which, tell us which link you're, you're clicking on that's, that's taking you to .com. Yeah, Rob says it should take you to your own country store. Yep. Okay, Irene says, and she is not here. She wants to know how to practice consistently and grow the skill without a lot of people around. Well, that's the trick right now, isn't it? Um, so I know that a lot of people have been practicing things. Um, so finding a subject that you don't need a, a person to photograph, so work on your macro photography, work on your still lives, work on some light painting or something that you don't need a person for, right? Um, Rob's gonna share a couple of challenges. There's another one which is use your camera every day, okay? Um, there's another one somebody asked about, I'm gonna pull this in here because it's kind of similar. Um, Allison asked about composition. How do you make an, an ordinary item look interesting, right? So that, there's something that you can work on as well. So making a, there's a challenge on that. If you can find all of those, Rob, there you go. Okay, how to make an ordinary object look, look interesting. Generally, um, Anne is really good at that. She does lots of abstracts and things. You could use intentional camera movement. So you could blur on purpose. You can get closer, you can do some macro, okay? So generally how you're going to work on um, growing your skills without people is find some subjects that, that don't revolve around people, right? Whether it's your pets or things in your yard. Um, if you don't already have um, my 
10 challenges ebook. That's another good one to do because a lot of what you can do is actually working on um, this muscle, okay? So learn to research different things, study art online. If there's a link to the 10 challenges ebook, Rob, that would be great as well. Um, Ron says it's taking you to the US site. It's possible that that item's not available on the .ca then, Ron, or you could just go to amazon.ca and search for the same item. Okay, so Joanne, Joanne, is she here? Yes, okay, so Joanne wants to know camera settings quickly for blurry pics. So do you want to come on audio and tell me, did we answer, did I answer some of those questions for you during the slide presentation, Joanne? Oh, you can unmute yourself if you want to go on just audio. Okay, and there's the link for the 10 challenges in the chat. Where are you, Joanne? Oh, there you are. I'm here, but so, I didn't ask that question, I don't think. Oh, <laughs> that wasn't you? Oh, maybe a different Joanne, okay. Yeah, it must be. Interesting, both spell it the same. Oh, I was the one with the glasses, the big nose and the viewfinder. Oh, <laughs> this one was pre-submitted when you registered or when you um, said you were coming oh, okay. to the meeting. okay, maybe then. What was it again? <laughs> it said camera settings quickly, blurry pics question mark. That's it. That's it for sure. <laughs> like if you, you focus on a picture, right, and things are going cool, and you take one picture and then all of a sudden things change. How do you quickly change your aperture? Your Ah, okay. So the scene changed. The scene changes. How do I adapt quickly to this? Like Okay. So what mode are you shooting in most of the time? Manual. That's your profile. There's a first problem. Okay, Rob, we need the article on shooting in manual mode. So um, the article that he's going to share for you is basically talks about why I recommend not shooting in manual mode most of the time. Right? The reason being is that um, I choose when to shoot manual mode based on when I had to control everything and I can slow down and make those choices. Okay. Right? Mm -hmm. So generally most of the time that I'm using a tripod, so that's like a, a, a fixed portrait. If somebody's sitting still, that's a night shot, that's a landscape shot, that's a macro shot. Okay. If I'm trying to do street photography, candids of kids, I'm shooting aperture priority. Okay. Okay. My camera lives in aperture priority 90% of the time that it's off the tripod. Um, the only time that I use shutter priority generally is if I'm doing something like panning or I want to control, change the shutter speed. Yeah, I'm new to it to the point that I have done the aperture thinking this would help me, but I think I got it wrong because I think whatever the aperture is set at is the one I'm supposed to use. So I don't change that. I leave it and I'm getting a bunch of blurry pictures. Uh -huh. Okay, so that goes back to what we talked about is paying attention to are you on f11 okay because yeah. if you're on f11 which is small opening shutter speed is going to be slow okay so mm -hmm. if you're getting slow shutter speed open up your aperture and also check your iso most of the time i leave my camera set on auto iso okay? most cameras are now capable of auto iso and it's actually really good okay um so that other article we talked about earlier on on not being afraid of raising the iso as well so i think it's probably a combination of those two things that could help you so if okay. you set your auto iso you can set mm -hmm. a range what camera are you using uh 7d canon okay so the original or the mark ii the original Okay, so a little bit older camera. So be conscious of that it might not have as good a range as a newer camera because that's where the areas of, of advancement have happened recently is ISO um, and focus. So mm -hmm. maybe set your range to 1600 or 3200 until you sort of feel out what you're comfortable with as the maximum. But if you dig around in the, in the manual or find a good um, tutorial on YouTube about your camera. So um, there's a channel by Tony Northrup on YouTube that he covers lots of different cameras. Um, I'll just type his name in here. So if you do a search for this guy's name and your camera model tutorial, he's okay. probably got like a one hour tutorial on your camera. I'm sure oh, he does cool. for the 7D, okay? Good. And that applies to most everybody else too. Um, and he'll walk you through all the settings, all the buttons, all the stuff. And you wanna pay attention to um, the auto ISO parameters. So you can set a maximum limit and a minimum. And then you also can set a minimum shutter speed. Okay, so if you know that you're using, um, what's your most common lens that you use most often? I got to walk about 24 to uh, 105. 
Okay, so if you set your um your shutter speed to a minimum of one over say one twenty five, so one over one hundred and twenty five, mm -hmm. as a minimum, what happens is then the camera will not go below that. So if it hits that limit, it'll increase the ISO for you. Okay, so it's doing a lot of the heavy lifting for you in the background, and then that will allow you to to shoot faster in situations that you just like you described. Okay, cool, good, thank you, thank you very All right. much. All right, you're welcome. Okay, Zoya. Zoya is not here. I'm going to try and find everybody's um, questions that are actually here. Um, Allison is here. Okay, so let's do yours. I'm going to come back to Zoya's because she's not here. So Zoya asked about composition. So I think I answered that a little bit earlier, Allison, when we talked about photographing ordinary things in different ways. So did I answer your question or do you want some more tips on photographing ordinary things? You should be able to unmute yourself if you want. Uh, I can unmute you. Answered your question? Okay. Yes, you did. Okay, awesome. So what I recommend for, um, to just to kind of add to that is um, find another one, Rob, on simplicity. So simplifying your image. I find that a lot of times with composition, um, two things you want to watch out for are things on the edge of your frame. So take a picture and then review it and then look at the corners. Okay, because if there's going to be something like a trash can, that's where it's going to be. It's in the corner of the frame. And number two, simplify, meaning the whole KISS principle, right? Keep it simple. Um, and if you want to add the last one, you can. Okay, so keep it simple, meaning less things in your picture. Okay, so I'm just going to change my, my photo background here and I'll show you a few sort of different images that I've, I've shot as my little virtual background here. So notice that this one only has sand, okay? That's it, sand and dunes. So really this one is about texture, okay? Sky, just a cloud, okay? Car, okay, so there's not a lot of stuff. I don't see the street, just a car, okay? So super simple, okay? Lorraine knows where this is. She was probably like, you know, up that morning as well. That was like 5 a.m. craziness. Okay. So it's simple, right? Keep it simple. Photographing the surfers. I just have, I can't get my head out of the road. Surfer and the surf, right? Going off into the sunset, right? Keep it simple. So does that help, Allison? So I'm trying to do things with less elements in the picture, right? If you have um, lots of stuff going on, take some things out, okay? So I recommend get closer, get closer, get closer. Okay, thanks. What camera are you using? Uh, Nikon D500. Okay, that's a good camera for sure. How long have you been doing photography? <clears throat> a little over a year. Awesome. Well, keep practicing because one thing that I say all the time, and um, <laughs> I know Rob quotes me on this often, is the photography is a journey. Right, it's not a destination. You don't just magically get up one day and you've arrived. Right, it's a practice every day. Okay. I'm still learning things. All right, well, now I'm still in Venice. Okay, so let's see. Does Patty have a question? Yes. Yeah, so Patty's here as well. Uh, so Patty's question was sharpness using manual mode. Did I answer your your question, Patty? Because we talked earlier about. I see you're nodding, okay, because we talked earlier about manual mode and focus are not the same, right? Was that something that was confusing for you? Yeah, if you want to unmute, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. Should be this a little microphone. Oh, there it is. There yes. you go. And um, I think I, I was very happy to hear you shoot in aperture priority and um, uh, auto ISO. I, that solved my problems. <laughs> Thank you. So do, do read that article. The manual shooting mode one also has a cheat sheet there for you guys too. So if you um, go to the manual shooting mode one, our different camera shooting modes, um, you can print out the cheat sheet and it talks about when to use each of the different modes too. Okay. Could I ask a question about composition a little more? Sure. The, the shot you have behind you. So yeah. let's say you're going out for night shoot or any, any kind of shoot. And now you have, how do you choose the spot? Are there elements that make it more interesting than the other? Like, do you look for the curve? Do you look for the building? Like, how do you improve that kind of composition? Okay, so you know this spot, right? Like this is yes. the, 
This is the bridge. The ca Academia so, Bridge? Yeah. Or is so, it, yeah, yeah okay. Academia Bridge. So Academia Bridge in Venice. And I chose, well, basically I chose the spot because there was nobody else there. <laughs> so it was really busy. <laughs> um, sometimes when it's busy like this, you don't have a choice. Would I have chosen a different one? Perhaps, but I, I don't mind the fact that the lights are coming from the left sort of going into the scene, right? Mm -hmm. um, and I framed it in such a way that I had the buildings on both sides and corrected distortion and stuff. So if I'm going to use things like leading lines, like the, the lines of the boat trails here, I make sure that they're leading to something. You notice that they point right at the cathedral at the end there, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And then the, the lights on the other side, the bright lights, which are like, right there, okay, kind of mm -hmm. keep you into the picture. So you, your eye goes around the picture. So I'm looking for elements in my scene. Oh, now I'm pink. <laughs> I like that as your backdrop. <laughs> um, yeah, I like that one too. So I'm looking for things that lead me into the picture and keep me there, okay? So okay. there's um, a couple of really psychological or very subconscious things about, about composition. Um, in our society, because we read from left to right, top to bottom, right? If you read a picture the same way and you have a leading line that goes to the right, and you may be seeing me backwards here, um, it leads people out of the picture, okay? Does that make sense? Um, let me see if I can flip this one. I'm not sure if I can mirror it. Okay, so if I reverse me, am I backwards now? Mm -mm. How about now? Which side are the lights coming from? Same side. Okay. Are they coming from the left side of the picture or the right? They're still, for us, the the streams are on the left. Oh, interesting. Okay. Huh. Okay. <laughs> That's interesting. So I, as soon as I reverse it. So if I was doing, if you imagine the picture flipped, okay, then the lights would be coming, um, leading you out of the picture, not in. Okay, so you have to be conscious of leading lines and which way, which way they're going. Okay, does that help? Yes, bit? thank you. I mean, mm -hmm. composition is a topic that literally I could talk about for a couple of hours, you know, like mm -hmm. there's a lot to it. Okay. Um, find maybe some articles on composition, Rob, and pop those in for people. Okay. Darlene? Mm -hmm. Um, one thing I remember that you did that helped me when I posted a photo on your website was you asked me, why did I put this bird in flight where I did? And I thought, well, because it's where the rule of four thirds is. But um, since then, I, I don't look at that so much anymore. And instead, I look for different sizes of the negative space behind rather than having all the negative space be the same and that that was helpful for me oh mm -hmm. cool cool good okay so valerie was asking about exposure compensation do you want to tell me what you mean by that valerie do you have any more to add to that so when i'm taking a picture and looking at the back of the camera i have a mirrorless um sometimes i just flick the exposure compensation then and I don't know why why should I do that compared to playing with the shutter speed or the ISO okay so there's something that's called EV or exposure value okay um, so let me just use my cup as an example okay so if my if my exposure value is in the middle of the cup here where my liquid is okay so that's the amount of exposure that I get if I leave it at zero, okay? So if this is like my histogram, okay? So if my, my meter is always measuring for zero, okay? So no matter what I do with the shutter speed, I'm still gonna get this amount of light, okay? So even if I increase the shutter speed, okay? Something else has to give, so the aperture has to close down or the ISO has to go down, and I'm gonna get the same amount of light, okay? When you increase the um, plus exposure compensation, now you're saying, I want this much light. Okay, so the camera's gonna fill up more light. When you say I want minus, it's gonna give you this much light, less light, okay? So it's filling the, the cup less. Does that make more sense? Okay, so when I say minus one, so let's say I'm going back to my, uh, now I have a white cat on a white sofa, okay? So if I photograph a white cat on a white sofa and I meter it using my camera, it's, it's doing what's called a reflective meter reading. So it's measuring the light bouncing off the cat and the couch coming back to me. Okay, 
but it's going to try and make them gray because that's what your camera's doing. It's medium gray, back to my shirt, right? Okay, so if you expose set to zero, you're gonna get a gray cat and a gray couch. Okay, so if you want white, you have to go plus. Okay, so plus is lighter. If you have a black cat on a black couch, you're gonna go minus to get the cat to be black. Okay, so it's about you interpreting the scene. So when you're looking through your mirrorless camera, okay, instead of just you know dialing it up and down. So when you dial the exposure compensation, you're actually shifting everything, the histogram this way or that way. Okay, when you're changing the shutter speed, all you're doing is changing the teeter-totter. Does that help? Okay, and asked about the hyperfocal point. You would ask me the most complicated question, right? <laughs> okay, so hyperfocal point, um, do I have my phone here? If you ha want to find the hyperfocal point, you're gonna be doing probably landscape photography and I'm looking for an app here right now. Okay, so photo pills. I don't know if you guys can see my, my phone or not. This one up the top here, I don't know if you can see it. Uh, probably not. It's called photo pills. It is a paid app and it does have a thing that will help you calculate the hyperfocal point. Okay, so it'll tell you, okay, if I'm shooting with this camera, with this lens, at this aperture, and I want maximum depth of field, and I'm shooting at f22, it's going to say, okay, focus at x feet. Okay, but in, in reality, how do you figure out, if it says focus at 10 feet, how do you figure out which bush is 10 feet in front of you, right? Okay, so I don't, I don't use hypofocal distance so much, but I'm also not a landscape photographer, so I may not be the best person to, to answer that question. But what I recommend is, again, back to that focus a third of the way in to your scene. Okay, so if you're, if you're focusing, if you've got a little flower in your foreground, like a little, I don't know, lily or daisy or whatever is growing in the mountain, I don't know what grows in the mountains, uh, irises, okay? And then you've got a mountain at infinity in the background, okay? Don't focus on the flower, focus a third of the way between the flower and the mountain, okay? That makes sense? Because remember, if you focus on the flower, a third of your focus is in front of the flower and you're kind of, you're, you're wasting it. So you're gonna focus behind the flower a bit. So what I would recommend, if you don't have a calculator or a tool to figure that out, focus part way in, take a shot, and then when you play it back on your camera, zoom in, to 100% and then look at the foreground and look at the background and see if you got it. So you could end up using like an F11 preferably? Landscape shooters are gonna shoot at F16, F22, or they're gonna do something called focus stacking and take multiple shots and stack them together. Okay. Right. Same thing with macro, right? Macro shooters do stacking, right? Because when you start shooting at F22, F32, you run into something called diffraction. Rob, now you need to find the macro article because it talks about focus stacking. Okay, Carmen asked about light painting. Is Carmen here? I don't see her name. I'll come back to that one. Um, Sandy, yes, Sandy's here. Okay, so Sandy, you have a good question. So Sandy wants to know, do you decide first what aperture you want to take the image and work the other elements around it? Um, yes and no. Do you want to come on audio if you want, Sandy? Uh, basically, my process is I usually choose my, if I'm shooting full manual, okay, I choose my ISO first. So if I'm shooting in manual, I'm probably on a tripod, which means I'm probably going to use a low ISO. Then I'm going to choose my aperture. Then I'm going to, the shutter speed is going to fall where it may based on the light in the scene, okay? If I'm shooting handheld and I'm walking around, Okay, then I'm in aperture priority, I'm using auto ISO, and yes, I'm choosing my aperture. But I'm choosing it based on, you know, how much depth of field I wanna have, but also keeping an eye on that shutter speed to make sure it doesn't go too slow. Do you wanna add any other questions around that, Sandy? I'm not sure if I answered that for you. I'm not sure if she's here. Oh. You're good, okay, perfect. Okay, so Anya had a question. I'm not sure if Anya's here. I'm not sure who AZ is. And Denise wants to know about twilight photos. Okay, so Denise. Denise wants to know about twilight photos, getting an image focused. Um, so 
Yes, I don't know who the person's name is though, Rob. So Rob, if you could find some blue hour or some um, light painting articles, because when you're shooting in blue hour, which is what you see behind me, okay? When you're shooting in blue hour, okay, I'm using a tripod. I've used a long exposure here, which made the, the boat trails, okay, show up, okay? What I'm doing to focus in this particular scene is I'm using the, the light sources. So I'm focusing on the light source and I'm using that back button focus. So when I focus using the back button, then when I press the shutter button, it's not refocusing, okay? If you don't have back button focus or you don't know how to use it, use your autofocus and then switch it off. Switch it to manual without hitting the focus ring on your lens, okay? So basically you just wanna lock the focus while you're shooting, okay? If you're, if you're shooting in twilight like this in a city, always pick a light source and focus on that. Okay, that's gonna be your easiest thing because remember you need contrast to focus on. So if you're trying to focus on, like if I go here, if you try to focus on the water in this, this area like down here, it's not gonna focus, okay? You can't focus on the sky and you can't focus here, okay? So focus, uh, <laughs> this is tricky, focus like there or <laughs> there, okay? Anything and really truly defined. Anything that has contrast, yeah. yeah. Now you'll notice that my, my lights in this picture, you see the little starbursts around them? Mm -hmm. Right, that is created when you start to shoot smaller than F8. So F8, F11, F16, you'll get starbursts. And, and um, depending on the number of aperture blades you have on your lens, you'll get more bursts. Nina has to Nina has to go. Uh, bye, Nina. Nice to see you. Um, I don't know if she had something else. Mm -hmm. you, you talked about you brought up the, this bad subject of uh, tripods. So let's can we have a <laughs> small discussion about that. Sure, the elephant in the room. Okay. Exactly. Or the moose. <laughs> the moose in my case. Yeah. <laughs> He's cute. It's a postcard. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. Okay. So what about the tripods? Well, I just, I've, I, is it finding the right tripod to take? I don't know, like mine has four, four uh, adjustments on each leg and by the time you get it set up and then you're trying to get your camera in the right place, I don't, is it just practice? Just stop my whining and practice with <laughs> Part of it, yes. Yeah. Um, part of it is that, um, if you can find the art, there's a couple articles on tripods, Rob, one on uh, tripod mistakes and then one on buying a tripod. So depending on which tripod you have, does it have the legs that lock with the rotating or, or a clip? They're the rotating one and it was recommended by McBain and I'm not happy with that tripod. Okay. I use the rotating one and I prefer the rotating one. I've yeah. used both. The reason being is that, um, the clip ones tend to loosen themselves. So you always have to carry an Allen wrench. I can't tell you the number of times I've been on location and the leg of my tripod just kind of falls down and I can't tighten it. Because yeah. you always have to carry an Allen wrench when you're using those ones. The, yeah. the, the rotate ones never loosen by themselves, okay? So there's that. Number two, I find them quicker because what I do is I have my legs folded up, I loosen all the legs and then I pull them down, then I tighten them, then I expand it. Okay. Right. And then when I'm closing it up, I squish them all together first, loosen, 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 press it down, tighten. Done. Okay. Done. So it's just a matter of finding a procedure and, and finding what works for you. And also if you're shooting like a sunset or something, get there earlier right? Get there an hour before you need to so that you're not rushing. Because I find that the biggest thing that happens with a lot of photographers is that they're always rushing because they want to get the shot and, and they don't stop to think about their settings or, and the tripod is there to actually slow you down on purpose. Okay. So slow down. It makes you look at your settings, think about your shot, frame your shot, right? So it's more intentional than just, you know, firing away. Right. So I have a challenge for you. In the next week, do not take a picture without a tripod. Whoa. <laughs> if you're up for that. <laughs> if you're up for that. Thanks, darling. All right. Because it's about it's about becoming one with your tripod. Do you have a question, Patty? Yes, I'm sorry to interrupt. Um, do you use tripods for your portrait shots when you're traveling abroad? Because they're so sharp. 
Um, uh, depends. Most of the ones you see travel, not. Um, because we're usually on the go and it's, it's a situation that's kind of fluid. If I'm doing like a family picture though, or a single portrait or something where I've done commissioned work and they're sitting in the grass posing, absolutely, tripod. Sandy asked, do you put your camera on the tripod and move from place to place? Yeah, it depends. Like if I'm doing um, with, the, with the tripod, with a camera attached, yes. So um, the article that Rob shared just above in the chat was the nine mistakes on how to carry your, your camera on the tripod is one of them. So you want to put the, if you have the, what you, what you want to do is fold up the legs. Um, I usually fold down one level so they're not sticking out too far. Put the camera on your shoulders so that, I'm going to do this like this. So imagine my tripod is, is attached to the bottom here, right? So I put my camera on my shoulder like this and the tripod sticks out this way, okay? So the tripod legs stick out in front of you, not behind you. Okay, because I've seen so many people on, on tours. We had one guy that, that came on a tour with us that was constantly tucking it under his arm like this. So two things happen when you do that. Number one, you could drop it and then you drop your camera. Number two, the legs are sticking out behind you and he was constantly turning around and whacking people, including us with his tripod legs. So being very conscious of where, where the legs are. Um, and if you're going far, I would definitely close it up more. Right, so I would, I would leave it on the tripod, but fold the legs down, right? But if I'm just moving 10 feet, yeah, I'll pick it up, put it on my shoulder, move. Good question. Um, ben wants to know, is Ben here? No. Okay, so I think we've covered everybody's uh, questions that are here. I'll cover the ones that are not here and maybe you guys will learn something from that as well. Okay, so Zoya asked, some pictures that I see are razor sharp. I understand this is a result of a good raw file and some post-processing. Um, I would like to learn how to achieve this result. So I'm going to answer that twofold. Number one, getting a sharp picture happens in the camera first. So all of the things that we talked about earlier on the slides, you got to do all that first because even a raw file can be out of focus, right? You can have a crappy raw file just as well as you can have a crappy JPEG. Okay, so do that first. Then when you go to process, if you are shooting raw, you definitely have to add some sharpening because raw files are not sharpened. Okay, so it's twofold. It's how you're shooting, um, the amount of depth of field and things you're using, but definitely that shutter speed comes into play, okay? Okay, how to sharpen images was Janet's question. And I think basically we've covered all of that. If, if she's talking about in software, um, that varies from software to software. I've got, I think there's an article on sharpening images in Lightroom. If you want to find that one, Rob, I'm not sure. See if that applies. Carmen wants to know about light painting techniques. I'm not sure. Yes, Rob shared that earlier. Okay, so light painting, for those of you that not, have not tried it before, is basically when you have, um, let me see if I can find an image here. Uh, when you're shooting sort of in the dark, and you use um, a light source like a flashlight or something. Technically, the image behind me is light painting because the, the trails of the lights from the boats painted themselves into the scene. So you don't actually see the boats, you just see the lights. Okay, so there's a couple of ways to do light painting. You can light paint on the subject with a bit of light. Um, I don't know if you remember, do you remember seeing the image that I shot in Venice? Um, Lorraine with the with the light painting because we did one one night with a couple of the masked characters. Yes, it was it was quite amazing. I'm looking for it to see if I put it in my gallery. I did. Okay. Um, okay, so I'm just going to share my screen here. Okay, can you guys see my screen now? Mm -hmm. So this is um, this is a shot we did in Venice with our workshop group. So what's happening here is there's a light painting tool that one of us went through. I think I was doing this. It was like a fiber optic and I was kind of wiggling it. And then Ugo, who was running the workshop, came and painted these fellows with a flashlight. And then just by serendipity, these two, um, it's actually two German ladies. We, we originally thought it was a man and his son and it turned out to be two German ladies. Um, this, this lady is like teeny tiny, like I'm five feet and she was shorter than me. So they just happened to come through and were observing what we were doing. 
and she found it fascinating. But look at the little starbursts all over her outfit, right? So they're wearing the perfect outfit, right? And we did, uh, let me see, we did something like that. So this one is just with the flashlight, right? So I'm lighting him up. So you don't actually see the flashlight or anything. We're just lighting the subject. So this is about maybe a 15 or 20 second exposure where I've walked through the scene and lit him up and I did not appear, okay? Because I constantly was moving. This one is the same as the first wow. one, except that these two guys in the suits with the lights, these ladies walked through the scene. So it was her idea. She says, oh, what if we dance through the scene while you take the picture? And we were like, okay, go for it. Um, the first one they did was in front of the people and that was too much. So then she says, okay, I think we need to go behind. So it was great to kind of have this collaborative effort with these people that just happened along um, when you're doing these kind of things. So light painting is just that. So right now, all of these little streaks are the lights that are on their outfits and they walk through the scene. So you don't see them, but you see the lights great. themselves. Okay, so that in essence is, is light painting. That's great. That answers that question. Yeah, and it's a lot of fun. It's, it's extremely addictive. Um, I find that, you know, when we've done this kind of thing, where's Anne? You know, we did this in, the, in a vineyard in BC. We were painting the grapes, and Rob and I were running around painting things with light. It we were ghosts. Making ghosts. Uh, you can make yourself a ghost. Um, what else? We can, you can spell things. If you use a light that, that points back at the camera, you can spell things. So, you just have to learn to write backwards. No, you don't, remember? You just have to flip it later. Yeah. <laughs> flip it later in, in the computer. Okay, um, Anya asked about manual settings, aperture, shutter speed, ISO. I think we kind of covered that already with some of the settings and that article I would recommend you read. And then Ben asked, taking pictures when the subject are amongst the trees with lots of shadows and the sun is overhead. So that's a bit more of a complicated question, but the short answer is uh, don't shoot people in the trees when the sun is overhead is the short answer. Um, get them into the shade. If you're photographing people, you might want to look at, maybe Rob put a link in for um, our portrait mini course. We have um, a free email mini course for portraits. We also have a free um, beginner course. So maybe pop those in there as well. Patty has to go. Okay, have a good dinner, Patty. She's got to go. So if you want to go through our email series for beginners, there's just an email sign up and we'll send you like one email every couple of days with a new article, walk you through a bunch of stuff. Um, and that will really help you. So the short answer to that question is, is yeah, don't shoot people in the sun when the light is overhead, shoot at a better time of day, get into the shade, get, get out of the harsh sun, right? Awesome, take care anybody that has to go i think that's the last question so i'm gonna go back over here to um my gallery view here does anybody else have any any last questions or anything else that you want to say and we'll head out for the evening thank you it was a great course learned a lot and back button focus is the way to go awesome <laughs> <laughs> thanks denise in the well, chat. Thank, you. thank you darlene thanks Great team, everybody. That was Rob, the voice of Rob in the background. Where is Rob? In the basement. <laughs> I was gonna say, put him on camera. He doesn't have a camera. I have to get. I have to get a new. I have to get a new webcam. He could join with his phone, but then he's he's in, he's in the dark. So, you might see him one day. <laughs> so I'll ask one last question. So sure. When you take your own shot, and you know, there's going to be some that are really tack sharp, and there's going to be some that are not as tack sharp, maybe because of the lighting or whatever. And you pinch it and you pinch it to see like, oh, is it sharp enough? Is it good enough? Who makes, like, how do you, is it just your own aesthetic? Like, I think it's sharp enough and then I, I'm okay with it. Okay, like, so when we need, did, we how need sharp the, is, you know. <laughs> We need the pixel peeping article, Rob. Yeah, so, how much so, pinching should I do? So what you're doing is called pixel peeping. So what that pixel means peeping. is when you zoom in either on the camera or on the computer till you're viewing the pixel level of the image, okay? You're looking at it at 100%. Nobody is ever going to look at it that way except you, ever. That's what I thought, okay. Okay, so imagine, um, imagine you go to an art show and you buy a painting that is four by six feet. 
how close are you gonna to stand to that painting? Right. Okay. okay. You're going to stand back, right? Like when you go to an art gallery, where do you stand? You stand several feet back, especially if it's a big print, right? So when you're pixel peeping, you're doing this. You're looking at it like this, right? Nobody looks at art like that, okay? Just you, okay? So how acceptable the sharpness is depends on your ultimate use of the image, okay? Are you going to print it in a big, large print on the wall or are you going to put it on Facebook? And then even still, okay? Um, I'm actually working on an article for this week on famous portrait photographers. Those ones that we talked about last week, Boris, I'm actually going to do a little uh, summary of some of them. So I have, a, I have a challenge for you, Lorraine, is to Google Julia Margaret Cameron. Julia Margaret Cameron portraits. Okay, I'll write it in the chat, sorry, for okay. you. Because her portraits were actually out of focus, most of them. And some of her images are extremely famous, but they're very... Um, ethereal kind of ghost-like very they're they're very unique and she was criticized in her time this woman was a pioneer she was shooting portraits in the 1800s okay um yeah like 200 years ago kind of almost wow. and and her pictures wow. are out of focus you go look at them they are not in focus and yet are they powerful images yes okay so sharpness uh, sometimes is overrated because if you look at some oh, of the I love most, that. <laughs> <laughs> you can quote me. When, when you look at some of the most famous um, documentary photographs or war photographs, how many of those have some blur, right? Yeah. A guy running from, from a guy with a gun and there's blur, like how much action and how much tension does that hold versus a sh pure sharp image, right? So yes, you can quote me. Tweet it. Okay. Sharpness is overrated. Great. Sharpness is overrated. I like. And that. photography is a journey. I'm sure I didn't write that originally, but it's like my saying. It's my mantra. It's my mantra. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks for all the great questions, you guys. <laughs> You've been awesome audience. Thank you. This was great. I hope everybody got uh, great value from that, and uh, I'll try and uh, come up with another topic and do another one soon for everybody. So great. take care. Stay safe. Stay healthy. Bye, Darlene. Thanks, Darlene. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Bye.